Erica Greenberg Schneider. Good morning. This is exceptionally overwhelming. Would everyone who's been my student please raise their hand? So from 2004 to present. Um, this is crazy. <laughs> it's a real sense of accomplishment, and I thank you all for permitting me and allowing me to be part of your journey, a small part, um, in graphic design. Um, I'm not a graphic designer, I'm a master printer, which I will get to later, because how I got there I think is a lot more important than actually, well, some of the things I'm doing now are really great, but how I got there <laughs> um, is, a, is a story that has to do with this theme. Um, I don't know how you feel, but when I, s I was supposed to speak in 2018, but the themes didn't talk to me. And when I saw Lost, I was like, I'm on it. <laughs> so I've had a year to prepare for this, and I haven't been able to. And every day, it kept changing. And then the other night, I was having dinner with a student, uh, uh, an alum, um, Elizabeth Bonert, and Rachel Clemenson, who's here, happened to show up and she said, it's so cool you're going to be the last speaker this year, like a motivational speaker. And all of a sudden I thought about the Universalist Church and everybody's shaking. I'm like, I'm not really sure I'm going to be able to do that, but <laughs> we can try. Um, but it's really nice to be here. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Jimmy Breen, who also a was a student of mine. Um, and thank you all again for being here. So lost. Well, I'm a baby boomer from the 50s. So I was born in 1957, and at that time, women had a bad rap, as most of you know. This isn't going to be a full feminist lecture, believe me. I'm just going to start that way. Um, but I think a lot of you can be very sensitive to that. Um, and, you know, we were told from a very young age, we cannot have it all. And even f women in my life, my professors, my aunts, my, except my mother, who was an exceptional being, um, told me, you know, go to school, get a high school diploma, and then find a husband. That's what we were all told. Have children, don't worry about a professional life. You don't need to do that. Let the man bring home the bacon. And, you know, hearing that from women was really astounding to me. And from my mother, on the other hand, was a feminist before the word came out. And she was told she couldn't have children. So she got pregnant with me at 35 and was like, oh God, what's this going to do? <laughs> and um, thank God at that time there wasn't any other choice than to have a baby. So she did. And her doctor was a French uh, Jew who had escaped Nazi France at the time and brought with him his nanny with his kids and his wife. And he said, look, Stephanie, don't worry about it. Take Madeline and you can go on your merry way. So that's exactly what she did. So I spoke French before I spoke English. I had smelly cheese in my lunchbox, so making friends was a nightmare. And I started reading the Figaro at age five, um, and Le Monde. And um, Madeline, who was the daughter of a rock sculptor with 14 children in her family, 11 of which were men that were all killed in both world wars. She was born in 1900, and the three girls in the family had a choice. They could either go to the nunnery or be nannies. So she chose to be a nanny because they were poor, and that was your only choice. And she loved America, except she never really learned English. You know, She spoke the English like this all the time. So by the time I got to kindergarten, I had a dunce cap on, and they told my mother I was retarded because I didn't know English. So finally, when they realized that, they started teaching me English, and things were fine. Um, but that education, her education, stayed with me. Um, for a very, very, very long time. Um, and one of the things that was important in that education was doubt. Um, a lot of America teaches their children to be so self-confident that you never doubt yourselves. And the French is, and the Europeans are a whole other education. You're told from the get-go, you're not good, you don't know how to do this, you better learn better, you better be quicker, you better be smarter, and you better get your act in gear. Um, now, learning that way, but within an American environment, is very difficult because the self-doubt turns into, I'm not good enough, especially born in the 50s with women already in a really bad place. So for very many years, I was convinced that I could do nothing, anything good with my life, and that I was at lost. I was just lost. And I realized through a lot of different things that I needed to find a passion. That passion is what made someone 
I don't know if it's great, but interesting, made your life worthwhile living, and made you able to share. Um, I'm sorry I have notes, it's just that I get off topic very easily, so. <laughs> um, so in 2013, I'm gonna jump um, a little bit, and then I'm gonna go back. Um, for very, very many years, um, I had issues with weight, with body, with a lot of things, and I thought I was going nuts because I was a weightlifter, and I knew I was a, not a small girl, but I was getting really big, and I couldn't understand where that was coming from. And doctors were telling me to take this body part out to do this, and I didn't believe them. So I went and found a few people in Canada that I really loved, and my coach said to me, it's a, they, we, did, we ran tests and we figured out what it was, and they said, well, there's two problems. There's the biochemistry, and then there's the psychology. They said, where you come from, your age group, you have this, these problems, these blocks, and we need to clear them. And Coach V was fabulous, and she taught me two things that were really important. One was letting go, how to compartment things and just get rid of it. Say goodbye and never look back. And the second thing she taught me was giving myself permission. Um, permission to let go, permission to love myself, permission to trust and to feel worthy. And I think that that changed my life. In 2013, I was not 20, so it's been a long journey. Um, and these permissions allow me to get out of lost hood, what I call lost hood. That's why I like this subject. Um, it makes my wayfinding more dimensional more directional, and it allows emotion, and most important, mistake and failure. Something I try to teach my students all the time. If you can't fall down and pick yourself up, you can't do anything. I think my failures have been more important than my successes, and my mistakes have always led to discoveries that were beyond imagination. Um, and now I'm gonna go back just a little bit to my childhood. <laughs> um, my parents were first generation Eastern European born Americans. My families were, for the most, killed during the Nazi concentration camps. And with that came guilt and fear. So the Catholics have nothing on the Jewish guilt because we never talk about it, but it's tremendous at that time. And I made a decision and I gave myself permission that I was not gonna live with that. Um, and it was a huge thing. And when my, we first moved here, my husband, sculptor Dominique Labouvie, had a commission for the Vanderburg Airport, and we worked with an art consultant. And I caught her cheating with money, and she called me a street fighter. But she called me a street fighter for the wrong reason, because I was right in catching her, but she was right in calling me that. I felt I've had boxing gloves on my entire life. Um, so the woman who started creating mornings, I don't know if you all know her, Swiss Miss Tina Roth Eisenberg, I'm absolutely in love with. And I was watching a video of her the other day trying to get inspiration and she said, ignorance, ignorance makes you question convention. I'm gonna change that and I would say ignorance and naivete make you change convention. Um, I go into everything with a huge amount of naivete. I've always been told I've been naive when I was younger. People said you'd believe the sky was falling. But it helped me stay balanced between lost hood and reality. Not always wanting to guess and second guess what was going on. It was a really, really important thing. For instance, when I bought my building in Tampa, if I hadn't done it with my husband with a certain level of naivete, I would have never have done it. Knowing what the um, permit commission was gonna do to me, knowing what the architects were gonna try to do to me, I would have said, okay, not today. But I went into it not thinking about anything and saying, you know what, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get there. And we did. It took a couple years, but we did. And one of the big words for us creatives, I think, is discovery. So for me, being lost a little bit is bringing you into a mode of discovery, because you've got to find your way. And creatives are always looking and searching for the way, the discovery, and being a pioneer who discovers new ground, maps new territory, maps new thinking and new existence. And pioneer is a word I know well. Um, taking inventory of who we are, what is unique about ourselves, gives us a foundation of information that establishes the best starting point to exit out of lost hood. Because we are unique, each of us, and we all have certain desires. So slides. So I am computer not savvy. Here we go. 
Okay. So when I was 12, my mom, who was very attentive to me, being different, I walked to a different drummer. I was just a different kind of kid. She was very on to the parent-student meetings, and they were telling her, you need to find a school for her. This is not the right place. And she didn't really understand what that meant, but she tried to expand my horizons. So we did museums every weekend. She got me into the Art Students League. So at 12, I was drawing naked Bowery men to learn how to draw the model. And um, one day, walking home, we run into a storefront in New York where there's this gorgeous guy doing sculpture with young kids. And I said to my mom, I want to do that. So we walk in. He takes me on as a student. Two weeks later, I see this woman walk upstairs. She had hair like Albert Durer's self-portrait, like in a pyramid, with black ink all up her arm. So I didn't know it was ink at that time. And I said to him, is that a tattoo? He said, no, go see what she's doing. She was making etchings. I never came back upstairs. I had found my passion. Um, and so my mother's best friend was an art historian, and she started to date this guy in New York named Julian Preto, who was the first pope of conceptual and minimalist art. And so my mother says to me one weekend, this is going to be great. We're going to go check out his new gallery. So we walk into the space. I think it was on Lisbonard. It was uh, really a dump at that point. And um, I walk in, and all the walls are white. There's four or five really sexy people walking around to be seen voguing. And I'm like, maybe it's a performance. Maybe those are the artists. You know? And all of a sudden, Mr. Preto comes to me and says, you must be Stephanie's daughter. And I said, yes. And he says, um, I'm told that you want to be an artist. I said, I'm not sure, but I think so. And I said, but where's the art? And so uh, a gentleman he was, he takes me by the hand. He said, could you please take three steps back? So like a waltz, we take three steps back. And he said, now you can look down. And there were eight rocks on a floor. I said, that's the sculpture. And my mind was blown. Because for me, all art was at that time were people drawing bodies. You know, during the, during, up, until the, up until the Enlightenment, it was all church. It was Jesus, Jesus, Mary, Mary, and everybody crying underneath. That, I mean, if you think about art history, and I'm not trying to insult anybody, it's my 12th century is my specialty, and I love it. But if you think about it, no one was allowed to paint anything else. And here, all of a sudden, there are rocks on the floor, and people telling me that's a sculpture. And I was blown away. I couldn't go to the Art Students League anymore and draw these guys. All of a sudden, I'd met my match. And I realized that minimalism was my thing. And I went searching for it. And that Thanksgiving, I, don't know, I must have been about 15, I think. We're at Thanksgiving. And I don't know how many of you know this, because you're a different generation than I am. But Bob Dylan had a really good friend. And his name was Phil Oakes. And Phil Oakes was a huge protest singer. And he was my cousin. And I didn't know that. And I had been listening to him for a long time. And at Thanksgiving, my father says, there's a present for you. you know? And it was, Phil was at the dinner table. He was bipolar and had a lot of other issues. So he wasn't very present in family life. But he was a huge anti-Vietnam activist. And think about it, in that part of the 70s, we were in full Watergate. So he was active. They were all active. And his, his famous songs are, I Ain't Marching Anymore and Love Me, I'm a Liberal. I mean, look it up on YouTube. It's all over the place. He's, he's, he's caustic. He's funny. And he's a good musician. Anyway, so he says to my father, you know, you should drop her off at Max's Kansas City the day after Christmas. I got a front band, Patti Smith, who's going to really good. And I think your daughter would like it. Because we talk politics. No one else. You know, you're not allowed to talk about God and politics. And so we were on the side talking about God and politics. And so my father, also where I got my naivete from, says, OK, let's do it. So a 15-year-old with a fake ID, he drops me off at Max's, doesn't even come in. Says, tell Phil I said hello. He said he was going to bring you home. That was an understatement or an overstatement. And so I walk in. The, the doorman says he's waiting for you. And I go backstage. And he was already gone. He was out. But he recognized me, introduced me to Patti Smith, and says, just find a seat, no alcohol. I said, I don't drink anyway. I was a good kid. In my naivete, I didn't do drugs and I didn't drink. And I went into a third row seat somewhere. And I said, I'm just going to watch this. She comes out on stage, and my life was changed forever. The first song she sang was Gloria. I don't know if you know that, that old Van Morrison tune. But the way she sings it is really intense. And then a couple 
I think a couple songs later, plus she was skinny as a rail, she had a bright white shirt on, real tight skinny jeans with holes in them, the sleeves were kind of dirty, it looked like she'd been high for a month, and you know, um, I don't know, it was just, I was 15, you know? And then she sings, um, well, she started, she was a poet, She's not, she didn't start as a musician, but when she was re reciting her poetry, you know, in St. Mark's Place, nobody would listen because they were all wasted. So she got a few friends of hers together and said, well, if I put this to music, I'll have more of an audience. And boy, was she right. And then she came out with Oath, which I had read, pre-read. And one of the first lines of Oath um, was, Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. And that was it. I was sold. Um, her work has always interested me. Um, and for the next year and a half, I lied to my parents, and every weekend I was in New York at Max's CBGB's or some flea bag, Lower East Side Hotel, following her and her band and listening and reading and talking to people. I also learned that binary gender was not the only answer in the world. Max's Kansas City, I walked in, there were boys that looked like girls, girls that looked like boys and creatures that I couldn't even tell you what was up. And I said, what is this? Um, being in a very protected family, I had no idea that this was a possibility. And then going into the bathroom, which I was scared to do, actually, but I went, there's this six foot four, shoulders like this, skinny like this woman, who turns around, has a jaw like a Tex Avery cartoon, opens up their shirt and says, so what do you think about my new girls? I was like, and where are they from? <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm telling you, when I left Max's Kansas City that day, I was over. When I would go to school, I couldn't even look at the other kids. I was like, I want to be there. That's where I want to be. <laughs> But that's true. It was Michael going to be Carol. And I said to him, you know, in my naivete, so I said to him, is there anything they can do about your jaw? And he said, I'm trying with makeup. I said, oh, you're going to do harder, do harder than that. And, and, they, and she became a very good friend of mine, and we stayed in contact until, he, until she died. Because, you know, at that time, transgender was a synonym with death. You know, you had three or four years. They didn't know what they were doing. And a lot of them didn't have enough money to go real, to do it really well. So it was butchering. And it was sad. And masses amount of people died every month. It was pretty crazy. Um, now, now we're in a, in a, in a much better place. Um, a lot of you and my students surely don't know, I was a real punk rocker man when I was a kid. I still am, but in secret in my studio, I listen to heavy metal all day long. But um, <laughs> this is Twisted Sister. Um, my first job when I was 18 was being a bartender, my first real job making real money, was being a bartender at the Mad Hatter in East Quag. Now, I don't know if you guys know about Long Island in the 70s and the 80s, but it was wicked. It was the meat market par excellence. People would get so wasted, they, could, they didn't know their name for a week. Um, and so as the newbie and the little girl, I was assigned to the bar band. So it was in the back, there was a bar in a pit, and they were on top of me. The sound was so intense that it would drive a rocket ship to Mars. So earplugs, earplugs, and earplugs, and I had to learn how to lip read. And then you have to learn how to bartend not looking. You're looking at lips, and you're taking bottles like this, right? And it's quick, and it was a real money-making industry. But I bring them up because they looked like this. It was kind of New York Dolls takeoff, right? But one, they were really good. They were really raunchy, but they were really good. But I knew them backstage. This guy, the lead singer, was a choir boy. He had his little high school girlfriend. None of them did any drugs. None of them did any drinking. They were straight as an arrow, all of them. And it was pretty cool. And I bring them up because this was one of my first big lessons next to Patti Smith. Dee Snyder said to me one day, the show of real intelligence is being able to sit with the President of the United States or the Hells Angels, hold a discussion and be comfortable and not be lost. That's exactly what he said to me. And I thought about that. And now I would say that's culture. 
but I have been at the table of two French presidents, and I was the next door neighbor in these villages to the Hells Angels, so I did accomplish both of those things. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, so, college time. Um, I go to Binghamton State University, don't like it, I'm definitely lost, don't understand what I'm doing there. It was a bunch of Long Island kids searching for reality and sex. And, you know, first time away from home, it's like, free for all, let's get as wasted as we can and let's do whatever we want. Um, I had been living out of the house for a while and I didn't understand that kind of attitude. Again, different, I was just always very different. And so I learned that Amherst was taking women. It was an all men's school and the charter shifted, the board shifted and they said, girls it is. It's so the five college areas, so you have girls school, Smith and Holyoke that can't change. You have Hampshire College, which is the ex experimental university. And then you have UMass. So I figured I'd apply. My father was class of, 70, was class of 49, which would have made, which would have make, would make me class of 79, 30 years later. And I wanted to make my parents happy because they were pissed that I was going to be an artist. Um, I was destined to be a doctor. I was a mathematics and physics major. I wanted to be a string theorist, but not really. And so I get into Amherst. But Amherst was not ready for me. And I was definitely not ready for them. My classmates were people such as Prince Albert of Monaco, Cary Grant's son, amongst other very famous and rich. And I was in the middle of this, and I realized that the admissions director at the time, Ed Wall, fabulous man, decided that he was going to get them back and take crazy women. Like, find women who weren't going to be doctors, lawyers, or Indian chiefs and who were going to shake the world. And we shook it, I'll tell you. They were definitely not ready for us. When we moved into the dorms, there were still urinals and no bathrooms. It was like, okay, new way of looking at the world. But, um, <laughs> but I can say that, um, I received the best education anyone could have had, and I thank them every day. Because without them, I wouldn't have learned how to deal with the rich and the famous, or be able to beat my own drum and prove to people that I was in the right direction doing so. And they were a huge step in getting me out of my lost hood. Um, we had my 40th reunion recently, and I ran into some of the other first women, and we were talking about how isolated we were and how nobody really wanted us and how not good enough we felt. And it was really very nice to have that. I always thought it was me. I thought, because I came from a middle class family um, that didn't have the same values as some of these other people, and it's the reason why I felt not part of it. But then I found the answer. I joined a non-fraternity and lived in a house with all the minorities that weren't wanted either. So we were all happy together. <laughs> No, it's true. It was, a, it was an odd time. You know, it was a very, very odd time in, in United States history. So my junior year, I decided it was time to make a change. And I loved Amherst, but I needed a break. It was intense, and I went to Paris. I got a full ride, and I went with Sweetbriar Junior abroad, which was hysterical, and I love them. And I went to Paris. I wanted to see my nanny, who was still alive in her 90s, well into her 90s. And I wanted to feel that country. I'd grown up speaking French, and I got off the plane, and I felt home. Um, it was a very odd feeling. I realized I was not American in the soul of my body, that there was something else going on in my thinking, and I just fell in love with Paris. I did the, what they told me to do. I was a jusseur for mathematics and physics, but it was impossible. I had a professor from India, from Pondicherry. I couldn't understand him in French, and I couldn't understand him in English. And so mid-year, I said, that's it, I'm done. So I went and found a place to learn printmaking. Um, this is the Cité Verte. I don't know if it still exists. I don't think so. Rue Léon Maurice Nordman. Um, and in there was a, was a printmaker who was over 90, who had worked for Duchamp, who had printed Degas, who was an unbelievable man of technique. And I found him. And I said, can, can I? come here? And he said, I need somebody to help me. I said, you got it. And I, live, I moved in. It was one of the most extensive, unbelievable experiences of my life. Because up until that point, I realized that I'd lived well, but I'd lived lost. Because I had not found my place. I found it. But the first thing he had me do, because I want to learn lithography really badly, was he had me copy Delacroix's Lion. 
I don't know, that's a lithograph, that's pretty intense. Definitely not my minimal aesthetic. Um, and he had me copy it, I think I did 11 times to get it right. And then he ripped everything up, he said, now you're ready. I said, I can't even keep a print? He said, no, no, <laughs> forward, we have to move forward. Um, I owe him a lot. He um, taught me how to be patient. He taught me how to mix ink to my liking. Um, he taught me how to take raw pigments that you could find and make these unbelievable colors. Um, and he taught me how to love being dirty. He taught me how to love discovery and not being able to predict everything that was going to happen. It's when you're printing, you better be ready for that. That's a pretty intense thing. Um, uh, as I was um, trying to find my way, after, well, after Calvert Brun, I went home, got my master's degree in printmaking and sculpture. Then the only thing I dreamt about my whole life was going back to France and living there. So with $5,000 in my pocket and a ticket and my passport, I went. I didn't ask for permission. I said, I'll figure it out. And so I went back to Calvert Brun because it was easier. And I started working with him in classes, but I was tired of printing this junky junk stuff. And through him, I met someone who introduced me to a commercial printer in the red light district, Guy Le Coureux. And Guy taught me everything I wanted to know about lithography and some. But, you know, I was printing Madonnas and children. I don't know how many of you have ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book and the 10,000 hour rule, but I did that. 16 to 20 hour days, six days a week, I printed Madonnas and children for Japanese artists wanting to be Western. Editions of 50, off stones, day glow, not day glow, red, pink, black, you name it, I did it. And I got to a point where you could hand me anything and I could do it. And I was getting bored. And I wanted to print real, I mean, for me, what was real art. And so one day I get a phone call, and it's from a, uh, a North African publisher named Francois Benichou. And he said, I need to see you. I'd met him. I'd been like an SOS printer. I'd been working in about 12 different shops. And he says, look, I've got a big deal, a big fish, and I don't want anybody else to do it because I don't want them to steal him from me. Do you have a shop you can rent? I said, yeah, I can work nights where I am now. So we went to see Monsieur Le Coureur. He handed me the keys. He said, I'll see you in 10 days. I didn't even know who was coming. And then we had a, an appointment one morning at 11 a.m. and Benny Shu shows up with Keith Herring. At the beginning of his career, I almost fell over. He had a posse of boys with him. Um, and I was like, whoa, this is going to be interesting. And I said, what, what are we making? He said, two color lithographs. And I had already prepared stones and plates. I didn't know what he, wanted to, what he wanted to do. We started talking and he started drawing. And within an hour, he said to me, there's an issue. I need inspiration. Would you mind if my boyfriend danced? And I went, sure. His name was Ludovic. He was a ballet dancer from the Paris Ballet. He was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I can't even begin to describe gorgeous to this guy. He gets on top of the litho press, and he starts doing a striptease. Um, I was 23 at the time. Um, I had been introduced to this kind of thing, but I had never really lived it. And I think I turned purple, and I had to go out for air. <laughs> and um, Keith comes running after me, and he says, you know, I like you. We have the same taste in men. <laughs> so, and I said to myself, wow, this is going to be fun. And boy, did we have fun. They were great. Um, we worked for a week together. We made a portfolio called Ludo um, of five prints that were just phenomenal lithographs. And I had made his very first lithographs. He had not made prints before. Um, and we stayed friends for a while. He would call me anytime he was in France and would have trouble because the radio station wasn't translating him right. You know, he was a real fighter for, um, you know, gender, gender thinking and homosexuality. And he wasn't afraid. But, you know, people, it wasn't really out of, the, out of the closet yet. You know, there were some people who were hip to it, some people were cool, and a lot of people who just didn't want to hear it. So he just wanted to always make sure that his voice was heard, and I admired him for that. And when we finished the project, you know, Benny Shu was cheap, you know, and I was this young printer. And all I wanted to do was buy this jacket, this Swedish pilot jacket in leather, because um, it was really punky and I really needed it. And I was tired of dressing and um, used clothing. 
And so I just asked him for enough money to buy that. You know? And he always thought that was too much. So Keith had said to me, how much is he paying you? And I told him, he said, that's not fair. And so he gave me two drawings. And he said, you have my permission to sell these. And he wrote me a letter. He said, but call me first, because I might have a dealer who'd really want them. Um, I still have them. Um, I don't know. That was great. So once I got that behind my belt, I felt more confident. And I knew I was good enough. And I knew I could do it. It was just finding the studio. When I had gotten to Paris, I moved back permanently in 1981 after graduate school. My first interview, now remember these names, there were two people responsible for bringing lithography back to the table. It was Fernand Morlou and Emmy Mag. Those were the big boys who were big publishers, had a lot of money, and were rocking it. Those were the guys that Jackson Pollock went to see with his GI Bill, that de Kooning went to see, all of them. And my heart said to me, and my mind was like, I am good enough. I want to work with those guys. So my first interview was with Jacques Merlot, the son of Fernand. And I put nice clothes on, like you do in America, right? That's where I was in French. And I walk in, and he looks at me. He says, turn around. So I turn around, and he says, OK. You can come in my bed any day of the week. You can come in my kitchen any day of the week but you're not printing in my shop. Women do not do lithography. And I said, really? And I said, not even a chance? He said, no, go. I was crumbled. I thought my life was going to end. But I turned around to him and I said, you will regret that. You will regret every word of it. And I walked out of there, and that started a long, long journey of being told the same thing over and over and over again. Women do not belong in a print shop. Women do not belong in a print shop. And so finally, when Guy Lecureux said, you know, I'll test you out, but I grained for six months in a basement. And then finally, when he let me upstairs to print, he said, one condition, you ask no men for help. You have to carry the stones. You have to carry the boxes. You have to carry I, no help. And I'd been a weightlifter already since I was 16. I was like, lead me to it, baby. I'm ready. You know? And the stone was on the third shelf. I pick it up. I like a squat. I walk it over the press. I put it down. And I'm like, where's the ink? And I, it was a novelty. The entire shop was like, I was like, I don't need your help. I can do this. And this was the start. And again, I was printing, as I said, Madonnas and Children. I had enough. And after Keith, you know, I said to myself, I can do this. I need to find a job. So I had just heard about a young man, Frank Boldas, who had opened up a studio. I didn't know how he learned lithography. I knew nothing about him. I took 20 prints, including the Keith Herrings, and I went to see him. And I said, I really want to do lithography. Will you hire me? He said, take your jacket off. I got something waiting on the press. I went, really? He said, I don't care what you are. You could be a camel for all. I, I just want to know if you can print. He said, I'm your age. Like, I don't have that problem. I went, OK. And I started on a huge project all by myself. And the third day I was in the shop, this gentleman comes in, this old man, takes a chair and says, you don't mind if I sit and watch, do you? I said to myself, boy, that's a weird comment. OK, why not? Right? He rolls up his sleeves, and he just sits there and watches. Doesn't take an eye off me. I move to the right. His eyes move to the right. I move to the left, move to the left. An hour later, it's lunchtime. There was always, we stopped always from 12 to 2, very French. And I get up, and he says, are you coming to lunch? I said, well, I'm not invited. He said, I'm inviting you. He said, I never thought in my entire life I would ever see a woman behind a press. I went, here we go again. Um, <laughs> and so we're walking to the restaurant, and the pressman, who was named Marcel Trousseau, who I found out later is a very famous guy who had printed all these wonderful things, said to me, you really impressed Monsieur Fernand? And I said, who is that? He looked at me. He said, you don't know who that is? I said, no. He said, well, it's Frank's grandfather. I said, oh, but he obviously knows something about lithography. And then the group of employees were cracking up. like They realized I really didn't know who he was. And Fernand said to me, what did you tell me the first day you started working, why you came to Paris? Who did you want to meet? I said, Fernand Merleau. I said, well, he just sat with you for an hour. I passed out on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> and so there he is with his grandson. 
And I found out that he didn't like his son when I told him what his son had told me in my interview. He said, he never saw you print. Your arms are bigger than half my guys. It's no problem. And so, you know, and I ended up being friends with him until his death. I mean, he was a, he was a fabulous, fabulous man. And so I had acquired half of my journey. And so a couple years into it, my husband, well, I meet Dominique, we get married, and he gets into the gallery mag. That was like getting into pace in America. It's a big deal. And one day, his, the gallerist, the owner, Adrian Mai, calls me while I'm at Frank's and says, I really need to see you. It's important and it's urgent. And I said to myself, oh my god, Dominique must have insulted one of the daughters. He must have done something bad, and they're going to tell the wife so I can tell the husband. You know, typical French, you know, never go direct, always go around. And so um, I show up at the end of a day exhausted because I've been building a machine. And he has me sit down in his fancy chair, and I'm in a workman's overall full of grease. And he says, my daughters and I have been thinking about it. Now, you have to understand that the Mike family went through horrible, horrible lawsuits because his father disowned him. It was just a mess. And he finally got his name back. He finally got his gallery back. But they were the most important publisher in Europe for 25 years. And the shop just stopped in the late 70s. So he says to me, we've thought about it, and we'd like you to put back together Mag Editor, Mag Publisher. And I looked at him, I said, me? Really? No. I'll find you someone. He said, no, you. I said, you don't want me. I'm a girl. This is a problem. I'm in France. I'm American. You don't want me. And my husband's in your gallery. We don't both want to be in the same place. He said, take two days and think about it. I said, all right. So I'm driving home. I almost get in an accident because I realized what he had asked me. Picasso had been through that shop. Miro had been through that shop. Brock had been through that shop. And I'm like, unbelievable. And the most, for you who are graphic designers, you all know who Saul Steinberg is? So Saul Steinberg was the first designer ever published by a fine art publisher at MAG. And the first day he goes to the shop, Miro's working on his big prints, the Enchanteur. And he walks in, and he's like, oh, the master's here. There's no room for me. And he walks out. And Miro stops the whole shop, runs after him, and says, come with me. You have every right to be in here. So it was the first time that a designer crossed that line in the history of Western art. I mean, in contemporary history of Western art, which was pretty cool. So I ended up saying yes. And I rebuilt the shop at the Foundation Mug and in Paris and stayed with them for 10 years. Um, until I couldn't do it anymore. Working in somebody else's family business, there's only one other thing worse than that, is working in your own family's business. <laughs> um, and so I just figured, you know, it was time to go. My father got sick. I needed to come back to the United States. And Graphic Studio at USF Tampa offered me a job because George Bazlitz would not work with Americans. The only American he would work with was me. I had worked with him on a, on a thing in Paris. Um, he, I'm not the only one, but he's never published in the United States. You can look, he hasn't. Because he never liked the American, you know, everything has to be a right angle, everything has to be perfectly clean. We're going to shift into printmaking a little bit. You know, it's no fingerprints, no nothing. You have to be able to eat off the floor in the shop. You know, it was scientific. It was a lab experience. In France, it was kitchen, you know. You taste things, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, you were dirty, nobody cared. You ate with dirty hands, it didn't matter. We used to cook stews on top of the heater for etching plates. I mean, you know, um, I have pictures of me actually smoking while I'm washing a plate with gasoline. Like, it, this is, France was France, America was America. The other thing was that big European was not like big American. Big American was eight feet of copper. Big French was like, if you hit 30 inches, that was already like, oh my god, that's really big. So you know, I decided that I would do it, because we were also making big Chuck Closes. And I figured, and there was Deli Sacciolato, who was the king of photogravure, and I really wanted to perfection myself in that. And I figured, you know, this would be a good time to mix European and American way of looking at printmaking. And, I finished that book. It took me four years to finish it. It was very difficult. It took me a long time to find and train the printers that could print it with me. 
Um, Boslitz, this is all dry point, which means he takes a, a needle and he draws directly into copper. But he doesn't take a needle. He takes tools and has them sharpened. So when you wipe the plate, you end up with looking like Freddy had hit you. Um, you know, bloody hands. So we had, you know, I had to teach people how to, how to touch this, how to look at it, how to think about it. And plus, nothing lined up. You know, when we did the, the two color plates, for instance, the color plate was always a quarter inch off the black plate. And in America, all they want to do is cut it and make it even. And he, you don't cut his plates and make them even. That's what he wants. He wants people to see the work. You know, it's really, really important for him. And I was really proud of this. It was called Signs, and we worked with Robert Creeley, fabulous American poet, may he rest in peace. Boslitz is now 80-something, um, still painting upside down figures. That's what he's known for. Now, these are two of my heroes, and I put this in here because we're, we're talking about Lost. Now, Degas, most of you know, right? His beautiful pastels of the ballet dancers. Um, when I had worked with an artist who just recently passed, Michel Ass, a French painter, we had made 50 lithographs together. And at the 50th lithograph, he bought me a book on Degas as a present. And he marked a page in it where it says, Degas said on his deathbed, if I had to do my life over again, I would do it in black and white. That was intense. <laughs> um, but I understand. Now I can understand that. And then Matisse was very sick at the end of his life. Here he's still standing, but for a long time, he would draw in a wheelchair. And as you see, he's got a bamboo stick. And at the end of bamboo, the bamboo stick is his charcoal, because he could hardly use his hands. And one of his assistants had invented that for him. And Matisse always used to say, every morning when I wake up, I need to go into the studio with the eyes of a child, or I'll spend my life always making the same thing. And I adopted that attitude in printmaking, which caused me, almost for a decade, huge problems, because things like photogravure or lithography are exceptionally chemical and technical. And I'd wake up in the morning and not remember what I did yesterday. So I started writing things down so I could have that option of not remembering just to think about how to approach an image. Because one of the things I always criticized about American printmaking was that when I looked at a print from a famous artist, I knew exactly what shop they made it in. So you'd have five very different artists, and the prints would look very similar. And I said to myself, I don't want people to know that Blasier made this. I want them to see the artwork first. And the, fact, fact, the technical fact behind it, we can always talk about. But for me, which what I learned in Europe and what Europe brought me, was you follow the artist. You don't follow the technique. And my husband one day, while searching through paradise to finish a sculpture, um, said something really beautiful. He said, materials never have the answer. And they don't. This is where the answer is, and it always has been. It's just, how do you get there? How do you make that full circle? Um, some of you will recognize this. This is Paula Scheer from Pentagram. So I started teaching at University of South Florida. We're almost done. I've got a couple more slides. In 2005, um, and one of my big desires, and Joni Spadero, who was the director then, was to bring printmaking into graphic design. And it took a very long time. Finally, I was able to build, design and build, help build, and write the curriculum for a shop at Harbor Hall. And the first, I decided to do um, an undergraduate research initiative. We had to call it something fancy so I could get funding for it. And the first person I brought in was Paula Shear, because she's a client of mine in the shop. I make stuff for Pentagram. Sometimes it's actual prints, and sometimes it's things I don't, you know, they want something etched, I don't know. Um, and I asked her one day, I did a whole series for Print Magazine of um, her political work. And I said to her, do you have anything I can publish? Like something really cool in type? I'd like to cross that line. I'd like to join Saul Steinberg at MAG. I want to cross that line. Because she paints. You know, she paints maps. And, I, and she has a silkscreen guy who does her maps. I didn't want to reproduce paintings. I wanted to do something fun. So she sends me to her archivist, and we start looking. And we find four things that don't have copyrights by other people on them, so they were free, that were hers. And this was one of them. So the bottom was what she had designed for the Seams Museum in Jerusalem. 
At the time, they had this poster contest. They invited 200 famous graphic designers all over the world to do work about coexistence. The war broke out. Hers never got published. So she owned it. And she said, you know, typical graphic design thing, let's do a big silk screen. I'm like, I don't do silk screen. I teach it, but I don't do it. I said, let's do something else. So I thought about it. And I made her a small gravure from, the, uh, from the, um, the Photoshop file. And I brought it, it was beautiful. I mean, I thought it was beautiful. I brought it to her and she's like, big, make it bigger. That's her slogan. And I went like, how big? She said, big, huge. So it sat on the back burner for five or six years. And then Christine Richardson is here today. One of my students said, I'll carve that in wood. I went, good luck, baby. Let's, let's go buy a piece of wood. So I bought a piece of wood. I had something printed on a plotter, so we had the outline. And Christine started, and 15 students were on it. By three years later, we still weren't finished, and it looked terrible. I mean, it just wasn't right. But Paula thought it was a good thing, and she celebrated the students. And then CNC routers had happened, and I found one, and I said, let's route this guy. Um, and we hand finished all the curves and everything else. But, and it's big. It's as big as my press would hold. So it's like 64 inches long and 38 inches wide, and it's a woodcut. But then the color thing, you know, I didn't want to get involved in this kind of, you know, break the color in the middle. I'm not into the designy effects that are good in books, but not good in prints, you know, in fine art prints. So she and I started a discussion on color. And she decided, you know, she said it was for coexistence. And this, this country has a history of bloodshed, difficulty. She said, I want a red that's in between blood and the earth. Try to find that in printmaking. That doesn't happen. So I went to see a paint maker, and we milled it ourselves. Um, and the result, I mean, you can always come to my shop, and I'm more than happy to show it to you. On the slide, it's kind of. And then the next big guy I brought was Stefan Sagmeister. Paula introduced me to him during one of my trips to see her in New York, because she thought he would be great for the students, which he was. I don't know if any of you came, but the deal was he was going to make a print with the students. So these are big. This is. Uh, it's a Swiss size. It's like a little bit over five feet tall by about 31 inches wide. And he was supposed to do a question and answer for half an hour. He was very specific. No lectures, Q&A. The Q&A was standing room only, like, you know, like this. With, and he stayed for two and a half hours. And he talked for everything about online dating. Because <laughs> I think Elizabeth asked him that question about online dating. Um, he talked about, because he just came out with the Happy Movie, which is about his being miserable in love, um, to all kinds of things. It was really, really very interesting. Um, this is Jane Hammond. Um, and I brought this today because without Jimmy Breen, I would never have been able to do this. Um, she is a painter and a sculptor who shows with Lelon in New York. And she was doing a benefit print for the Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg. This was the first time I collaborated with them. And in that image are about 500 pieces of source material, photographs. And then she makes a sketch, and someone's got to put it together. That's way beyond my Photoshop qualifications. So I asked Jimmy if he would like to do this with me. And he was like, oh, that's cake. I was like, OK, let's do it. But I learned a lot through this, because the plates were never etching properly. Like I had these little monkey faces happen in the sky. Um, Photogravure is a hard process. You take a negative, turn it into a positive, put it on an etching plate, and then etch it like an etching. So good luck. It's a 24-hour process. I made 12 plates before I got this one right. Why? Well, I learned about, I forget the name, things that are left over. What is that called? Artifacts. I never knew that existed. So what would happen is in the film, I wouldn't see them, but the acid would find them. So I had a sock monkey show up right in the middle of the sky. I had, so I said to Jane, like, what is, we need to redo these. So I took a picture of a Florida sky that she, she chose one and worked on it. And it was a long process, but without Jimmy, I would never have been able to do it. And then um, a couple, about a month ago, I get a phone call. One of the best fairs, art fairs in Miami that I've been trying to do for years but have never been accepted, calls me and says, we want you to know that we've been following you for 10 years. And it's not because, you know, 
your work isn't good, but we get a lot of really good applications. But you make prints. You're a printmaker. You're a print publisher. And we have mostly original works on the floor. But we decided, because we had several of you this year that were really good, to open up a print section of NADA, the New Art Dealers Alliance Fair, that's right at Art Basel. And I said, sign me up. And so with that, I decided to do something interesting and to show three sculptors from three different nationalities that work with line and segment. So this is Richard Dupont. These are cyanotypes, which is an alt photo process. And I have a, um, a young man at school, um, Duncan Mastin, who's learning, wants to learn how to print well, who's been doing these with me. Um, so I also bring work into school sometimes because it's a way to form kids. Not everybody's going to be a graphic designer. I don't know if he will be, but he will have a set of tools that he can use for his life. And so um, this I have to look at because I can never pronounce the name. My apologies. Um, this is from a scan, a body scan he did 20 years ago in Texas at the NASA. He got a... Um, a grant to do that. And his work is in between. He's known, he works with both digital and hand work to make images. But the digital is really the origin of a lot of his images. Um, and this is dedicated um, to Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Excuse me if I butcher that name. Um, a Spanish neuroscientist who was one of the first, the first Spanish Nobel Prize winner. And he studied the microscopic anatomy of the brain. So he's the one who first identified how all the signals and all the things happen, all the, all the, how all that works. Um, and I found that fascinating. These are 22 by 30. Um, and there's four different ones, but I'm just showing you two. Um, this is a recent work of Dominique Labovise. It's called Pleiades. Uh, the Pleiades is after an open star cluster, also known as the Seven Sisters, that's found um, in the Taurus constellation. Dem a lot of Dominique's two-dimensional work has a lot to do with the sky. Um, he's fascinated by it. He talks about it a lot. And so this is something I've never done before. So this is, I mean, I did it for someone else a long, long time ago but never from my editions. And so this was printed from a plate. He found a steel plate in his studio. The shapes are things that he cuts out. So that's the first time through the press. It's printed on Japanese silk. Then I adhere it to white paper. So it's called shin kule. It's a technique that comes from the 19th century. And then I print a woodcut on it. And then that woodcut gets gold leafed. So it really looks like the Milky Way in sorts. Um, and this is, I think, 28 by 37, about. And then I saved this guy for last. This is the last image I will show you. This is one of the first um, professional prints, because he does a lot of rubbings in his studio, by Sopia Pich. Sopia Pich is a Cambodian artist who is a na considered a national treasure by the current government. Um, and I knew him in 95. He wanted to study in France. And I was kind of the gateway for a lot of universities would call me to help people get their paperwork done. His was a little harder. He was a boat person, and he only had transition paperwork. Try to go to the French government and get a stay card with transitional paperwork and no passport. It was quite a job. But we got it for him, and we lost contact. And he went to finish his master's at UMass, where I had studied lithography. And many years later, I'm taking my daughter to school. She got into the Jacobs School of Music. She's an opera singer. And I said to her, the only way I'll drive you is if you let me stop in Indianapolis, because it was one of the best sculpture collections for a small museum. And I walk in, and there's a rain of bamboo in the center of the museum. I went, no, can't be. And I look at the card, and it was him. So I called the common professor we had, and she says, I can't believe this. He called me the other day and wanted to know where you were, and I gave him your phone number. He wants to make prints. So three years later, it's exactly what we did. So this is called Spring. There's always a lot of images about hearts, because his father has a very serious heart condition, and thank God survived the boat. And so a lot of his images are lungs, hearts, or body parts. But most of his uh, work, his sculptures, are made from weaving bamboo. Um, and, it's, and it's pretty interesting. Um, and 
last but not least, you know, I don't know how you guys, I, sometimes when I'm bored, I'll look on the internet. I try to keep my number of hours down to a minimum. <laughs> but, um, you know, sometimes on Facebook, I crack up with all the squares with, you know, motivational words in them, which make me kind of like, ugh. And then w one day, all of a sudden, this thing pops up. My daughter was um, going to do her first international opera competition in Avignon. And my husband and I were scared to death for her because it's a big deal, you know? She's young. She was only 23, which was, she was the youngest. I mean, that's young to start competing. But she decided that she was doing, this is what she's doing, and we're fully behind her. And so I found this on the web, and I sent it to her, and she was thrilled. And I realized it would apply to any creative. And this box said, practice like you never won, perform like you've never lost. And I think that that is a great way to end this. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody for being here. It's been really a pleasure. And thank you, Tara. Thank you.